All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming inside on this gorgeous day. Uh, this is truly a credit to you, Dan, that uh, on a day, on Patriots Day, when the weather is so fantastic, you've got this many people here to discuss a very serious, weighty tome on the birth of democracy. And so it is a real credit to you. Uh, we are here, of course, to launch uh, Professor Ziblatt's new book. The copies just arrived today. So this book is literally hot off the presses. And I have the honor of being the moderator. Uh, my name is Mary Cerati, and I am actually a historian. Uh, my PhD is in history. And I work on a very modern time period. And so when Dan and I uh, met, uh, we had a good laugh over the fact that he is a political scientist working on historical eras, and I am the historian working on modern eras. And we have been friends ever since. So I'm honored to be asked here today to be among historically minded political scientists to talk about these truly pressing issues. So what's going to happen today is that Dan will take about 15, 20 minutes to introduce his new book to us to summarize some of the themes. And and it, as I said, is now available. Feel free to order it from Amazon while he is actually speaking. He won't mind. Uh, we on the panel have had the advantage of seeing advanced copies, and it is well worth the purchase. So uh, Dan will first give us about 20 minutes, giving an overview of the book. And then Dan has selected a, an impressive array of experts to respond. They have seen advanced copies of the book as well. And they have been asked to take uh, just seven minutes to just reflect on the significance of the book, either for scholarship in this field or for contemporary politics today. And our goal is that this will then inspire a broader conversation among all of us. So after they have each made their seven minute comments, we will then open it up to you for what will hopefully be a lively and insightful discussion about these major themes on the birth and death of democracy and their relevance for today. So let me just take a few seconds to introduce people very briefly. Uh, Dan Zilblatt, of course, is professor of government here at Harvard, specializing in the study of Europe European politics, state building, and democratization, as well as historical political economy. Dan, in 2006, published Structuring the State, the Formation of Italy and Germany, and the Puzzle of Federalism, which draws lessons from 19th century experiences of state building in Italy and Germany for political change today. And it was the winner of a number of prizes, including the Best Book Prize from the European Politics and Society a section of the American Political Science Association and other prizes. He has also co-edited the Historical Turn in Democratization Studies. And of course, today we are, as I said, discussing his book, Conservative Parties and the Birth of Democracy, which has just come out with Cambridge University Press. But Dan is actually already a couple chapters into his next book, uh, which he is co-authoring with Steve Levitsky, called How Democracies Die. And the publisher is eagerly awaiting this book. Uh, it's Penguin Random House, given the very contemporary concerns surrounding these themes. So we're glad you could take time off from your next book to discuss mm -hmm. this one. Uh, and among the panelists, we have a great array of expertise. To my far right, Amal Ahmed is Associate Professor of Political Science at UMass Amherst. Her work focuses on the dynamics of democratization in both historical and contemporary context as well. Her regional expertise spans Europe and the United States with additional background in the contemporary politics of the Middle East. Amel is the author of Democracy and the Politics of Electoral System Choice, Engineering Electoral Dominance, which appeared with Cambridge in 2013. She has also written extensively on issues of research methods and the epistemological foundations of social scientific inquiry. On my right is David Art, who is an associate professor of political science at Tufts. His re research interests include extremist political parties and movements, the politics of history and memory, and comparative historical analysis in the social sciences. He is the author of Inside the Radical Right, the Development of Anti-Immigrant Parties in Western Europe, which appeared with Cambridge University Press in 2011, and the Politics of the Nazi Past in Germany and Austria, which also appeared with Cambridge University Press in 2006. And David is currently working on a manuscript with the title, The Resilience of the Old Regime. On a personal note, uh, David was actually in the very first section that I ever taught as a TA at <laughs> Yale University. I was, of course, a phenomenon because I was 10 years old when I was teaching that section, <laughs> as, as, as David well remembers. 
<laughs> it will come up today. It will come up today, okay. <laughs> and obviously it was a great pleasure to have such a fantastic student uh, who was uh, did terrifically in that class and obviously as a scholar ever since. Then we have Professor Tarek Masood. Tarek is the Sultan of Oman Professor of International Relations at the Kennedy School. His research focuses on the role of religion in the Muslim world's political development. He is the author of Counting Islam, Religion, Class, and Elections in Egypt, which appeared with Cambridge in 2014. And he is co-author of the Arab Spring, Pathways of Repression and Reform, which appeared with Oxford in 2015, as well as, of course, numerous articles and book chapters. And on, the, on my far left is Dr. Yasha Monk, who is a lecturer in the government department here, but is also, uh, together with me, a fellow at the Transatlantic Academy of the German Marshall Fund this year. So it's been wonderful to get to know Yasha this year. And Yasha is, as of a month ago, a US citizen, as well as a German citizen. Perhaps some of you saw his New York Times op-ed on the experience of becoming a citizen in Trump's America. If not, I recommend, I recommend looking it up. Uh, Yasha has a, a new book as well, appearing, I believe, tomorrow. Is that true? Something like that. I'm very confused. You're very I, confused. I, I, I'm told it's now at Harvard Bookstore. It's now at Harvard Bookstore. So appearing imminently, Yasha's book is called The Age of Responsibility, Luck, Choice, and the Welfare State, appearing this week with Harvard University Press. So as you can see, a distinguished panel, uh, all of whom uh, ex are experts in democratization. So I look forward to a lively discussion. Dan. Thank you. Sure. It's great to have you all here. And there's some people in the audience who've served, uh, you know, you've, you've told sometimes it takes a village when I think about the village that helped me write this book, it was a very cosmopolitan village um, <laughs> of my colleagues and friends. And some of you are here. And thank you all for coming, though, today as well. And also thank you to the wonderful panel, to Mary, for agreeing to discuss the book. So just a deep word of gratitude for that. Uh, this book, so my next book is supposed to be written very quickly coming out next year. This book took about 10 years. So, um, <laughs> this, so I'm, I'm going to talk just for about 15 minutes about the book, sort of lay out some of the key uh, arguments in the book, and then really look forward to the discussion. I thought a, a useful way of beginning was to describe a particular moment, a moment where it occurred to me really what the book was about. I'd already been working on it for a while. This happened a few years ago. Uh, I was in Britain doing archival work, and I went to uh, Hatfield House, which is this, this grand home in the countryside of England, about 20 miles north of London. Uh, this was a home that was built in 1611 by uh, Robert Cecil who was an advisor to King James I, is the kind of first Lord of Salisbury. I was there, though, looking at the papers of the 19th century Lord Salisbury, uh, who was a Conservative Party leader, longtime prime minister of the, for the Conservative Party, member of the House of Lords. So I was there using, analyzing, looking at the papers in the basement of this house. Um, and about halfway through the day, the archivist invited me to go upstairs. So I went upstairs into this huge home. The place, it's usually a museum, but it was closed. The lights were off. And we walked down this, this long hallway that had marble kind of echoey floors with big walls covered with uh, oversized oil paintings of the family going back four centuries. And you kind of had this moment, this feeling that you're, at that moment I was in the, the kind of seat of British power, 19th century power. I mean, I was in the home of the most powerful man in the most powerful country in the world in the 19th century. And what was so striking though was that when I thought about the papers that I was reading below in the archives, there was an incredible juxtaposition. Because when we read the paper of Lord Salisbury, a lot of his letters and articles written from that home, there was an acute sense of panic expressed in these papers about the unfolding process of democratization, a sense of foreboding about what the world was bringing. So I'll just read to you uh, something he wrote in 1860, uh, uh, a few years before the Second Reform Act. Um, and, and you know, by the way, I mean, he's, this is a landed elite, an aristocrat, and he sounds more like a Marxist than you could think possible. But this is what he wrote in 1860. The mists of mere political theory are clearing away. The struggle between the English Constitution on the one hand and the democratic forces that are laboring to subvert it on the other is in reality, when reduced to its simplest terms and stated in its most prosaic form, a struggle between those who have to keep what they have got and those who have not to get it. Democracy is the right of eight beggars to govern seven Rothschilds, and what is more, to tax them. So there's this kind of acute, this combination of incredible power and acute sense of fear. And this, the, the question occurred to me, really, at that moment, as I thought about it, 
You know, how did the historical owners of this particular home and others like them, who had so much to lose and so much power at their disposal, ever come to terms with political democracy without fatally preventing it from coming into existence in the first place? So how did old elites come to terms with political democracy? So what also makes this, this question, I think, so striking is if you think about European history, there's lots of instances of old regime elites, landed elites, conservative elites, blocking even modest democratic reforms. Fearful of the consequences of democratization, conservative elites have either often blocked any democratic reform from happening, or when a democratic change comes of later after the fact, subverting it or sabotaging the democratic reform. So I convinced myself that if I could understand the conditions under which conservative elites acceded to democratic changes, I could go a far away in unscrambling what I think is a major historical puzzle with global ramifications, how European societies democratized. So the, the book that I've written uh, is structured around really a historical observation, a historical question. The historical observation is that if you look at the period between the 1830s and the 1930s, what we often call the first wave of democratization, there were two patterns of democratization in Western Europe. In one group of countries, Britain, Scandinavia, Belgium, the Netherlands, the expansion of democracy, and by that I mean very specifically the expansion of the right to vote, increased accountability of executives to parliamentary bodies, the institutionalization of civil liberties. This process in one group of countries, in that first group of countries, proceeded in a very, un a very settled way by which I mean democracy proceeded in a fashion where there weren't major constitutional crises, there wasn't major instances of democratic backsliding or democratic breakdown. Democratic reform kind of proceeded along in a relatively steady way. I mean, there were hard fought battles and so on, but if you, one kind of useful way of thinking about it, if you look at the, if you've ever looked at the polity data set which codes countries' democracies every year through the 19th century, there's a kind of straight line, a kind of a unilinear path by which countries just keep getting more and more democratic. That's one group of countries. In the second group of countries, democracy proceeded in a very unsettled fashion. So when one thinks about Germany, Spain, Italy, Portugal, and to some degree France as well, democratization proceeded in a way in which there was moments of long periods of stalled reform, periods of democratic breakthrough followed by democratic crisis, democratic backsliding, democratic breakdown. So we often think of the interwar years, but this was also the, the case in the 19th century. Spain in the 1880s had moments of democratic breakthrough followed by moment, democratic breakdown. So in these countries, if you look at those same polity scores, you, instead of a straight line to democracy, you have very crooked lines in which there's moments of breakthrough, breakdown, breakthrough, long periods of stalled reform, and so on. So the question that I was interested in that motivates the book is to ask why over this long run period of 100 years did democracy proceed in a settled way in some places and an unsettled way in other places? The, the question I think is interesting to pose in these long term uh, kind of in this, in this, putting it in a scope of a kind of long-term process. Because often we, f we, we focus on short-term moments of change. And we're often then surprised by twists and turns. And I think it's useful to take this longer run perspective. I mean, I, there was an old professor of mine and friend, Steve Fish at UC Berkeley, who, who in the early 1990s wrote this book called Democracy from Scratch in Russia, in which he wrote all about the, it's a great book, on the promising developments of Russian democracy. Seven years later, he wrote another book called Democracy Derailed in Russia. Um, on the collapse of democracy. So my idea is you can write one book, you know, and ask why is it in some countries, some countries don't experience this, other countries do, and why? So the answer that I highlight in the book is, is different from how others have thought about this. Traditionally, we kind of think about the drivers of democratic change being kind of one of three things. First kind of paradigm that one, people draw upon when trying to understand why countries democratize and how they democratize is the idea that the unstoppable forces of economic modernization push democracy along, or give rise to democracy in a kind of impersonal way, but these unstoppable tides of modernization push democracy. A second view highlights the role of the working class, or outs of a political system, who wrestle power away from elites. And there's a lot to this, certainly. A third view focuses on a different kind of collector, the factor focuses on the role of the middle class, and again, wrestling power away from old regime elites. So these are three broad paradigms that have resonance when we think about contemporary cases of democratization as well. But my, my argument focuses much more on the old regime itself. Because each of these three views that I've just laid out in some sense hinge on a kind of common idea, common conception of democratization, that it occurs as, as the result of deep social transformation, overturning of social hierarchies. And again, there's certainly much to this view. But none of these views, these three views that I've just laid out, contend successfully, I think, with the fact 
that democratization is not just about erasing old democratic regime, pre-democratic regimes from the map, but it's often about granting concessions to old regime elites or getting old, former old regime elites to comply with the new democratic system. So how does one do this without giving away the game? I mean, that's in some sense the dilemma. How do you make concessions to old elites without giving away democracy itself? So I, I, again, I focus on the role of conservative parties. And my basic idea is that old regime elites are not passive actors just simply responding to these threats from outside groups. That old regime elites in the form of conservative political, and the conservative political parties that represent them uh, shape the process of democratization. And so the core claim really is that something key happened in Western Europe in the 19th century, but only in some countries in, in Western Europe, not everywhere. Old regime elites discovered the power of political party organization. Elites discovered mass political parties. They discovered that equipped with conservative, with per political party organization, they could concede democratization without necessarily conceding power. They could figure out how to win elections. So in 1860, Lord Salisbury was very much afraid of democratization. In 1884, 85, he helped negotiate the Third Reform Act. I mean, you know, he was initially against it, but participated in the, in the reshaping of electoral districts and so on afterwards. So he had come to terms with democracy. And I think one of the key parts of this process was that conserv the conservative elites discovered political party organization and, and built party organization. So with party organization, conservatives could go from being recalcitrant opponents to reluctant Democrats. By contrast, in countries where old regime elites delayed party building, they often relied on the state to intervene at election time, Germany, again, Portugal, Spain, Italy, and large parts of the 19th century in France as well. But without party organization, they were much more fearful, acutely fearful of, of democratization. And I'm always reminded of this incredible quote from General Ludendorff during World War I when uh, they were discussing, you know, should they end the war? Should they reform the three-class voting system? And there's this quote attributed to him in which he said he would rather uh, lose the war than reform the three-class voting system. Because at least losing the war would be a one-time thing, whereas reforming the three-class voting system would mean they'd have to live with this forever. Uh, and of course, they ended up getting both, right? Um, so, the point, though, is when, party, when, when conservative elites don't have party organization, they're more fearful of democratization. And this is a second key point, is that then they also don't have access to organizational firewalls to prevent, to, to, to limit the impact of their own radical right groups. Because conservatives often have at their base, throughout the 19th century into the 20th century through to today, conservative elites often have as allies radical right grassroots support. And party organization keeps these groups at bay. So when conservative parties are kind of loose, holding company kinds of organizations, this makes them vulnerable to insurgency from outside groups on the right. So the point here then is there's two different kinds of countries. There's those countries where conservative parties developed early, and there are those countries where conservative parties do not develop early, and I have an account of why you get these two different patterns in Europe. Just to give you an example of the, of the kind of way in which the radical right can serve as an insurgency on traditional conservative parties drawn from the German experience. I'll just recount a couple of events. So in the 1890s, uh, the German Conservative Party, which is again this kind of a aristocratic party of guys who kind of imagined themselves to be like uh, British Tories, um, and they had a very loose organization, and there was this growing uh, anti-Semitic grouping within the party, on the outskirts of the party, populist grouping led by a, pro a Protestant minister, Adolf Stoker, who was pushing the agenda of anti-Semitism. The party leaders who, you know, who were you know, not great Democrats themselves, but were ambivalent about this, because on the one hand, they viewed this as a useful kind of mass mobilization. On the other hand, they found this distasteful to, to participate in anti-Semitic politics. So in the early 1890s, there was a party Congress held in which the party leaders were going to include in the party platform a plank condemning anti-Semitism. A lot of the guys didn't show up to the event, the, the party leaders. They were busy, it was a kind of very loose organization. They didn't check IDs at the door, who the members were, who weren't members. It was all very unclear. The anti-Semitic groups who weren't members of the party showed up at the event, voted down the proposal to condemn anti-Semitism, and proposed an alternative plank in the platform to incorporate an anti-Semitic plank into the platform. And this was the first time in German history that a political party included an anti-Semitic plank in its platform. The grassroots, was a dangerous force for conservative parties. And there was an insurgency which pushed the party to the right. A similar pro uh, event unfolded in the mid-1920s in the Weimar period with the DNVP, the successor party to the, to the German Conservative Party, the Prussian Conservative Party, uh, 
had participated in democratic politics. It was passing laws. They weren't particularly democratic, again, in, you know, at, at, at their core, but they were willing to play the democratic game. Um, the party had a electoral disappointment in 1928. There was a media mogul, Alfred Hugenberg, who in movie theaters, a national network of newspapers, the largest newswire service in Germany, who had never held political office in his life, uh, carried out an insurgency campaign and took over the party, got himself elected uh, by funding local associations and got himself elected into this position of party. So an insurgent took over a party. This may sound familiar. This, of course, pushed the party to the right. So the point here is that a weak decentralized party often can't serve its gatekeeping function in democracies. So I think I'll end there. Um, just one concluding uh, thought. So this book really began, this is kind of a methodological point in a way. The book really began as a, as a kind of work of political history by a political scientist, engaging what I think are important uh, theoretical debates about the sources of democratization. But like all of us who study democratization and conservatism, populism, democratic breakdowns, like events have kind of collided with our work. Um, and so I'm reminded of this incredible story I heard recently of a British uh, biologist who spent his career tracking the migration patterns of uh, butterflies in the English countryside. And so he would track where they went every spring and summer and how far north they went and so on. And he was engaged in an important scientific community where there was these you know, heated scholarly debates and he was making important contributions to the scientific community, but his research certainly wasn't particularly high visible in the UK or elsewhere. But little did he know that the UN Intergovernmental Panel, panel on Climate Change was hard at work and found his evidence, and it turned out this was a key piece of evidence that they used in their report that was intended to convince climate skeptics, and in fact did, uh, of, uh, as prime evidence of global warming, that butterflies were now changing their locations. So the, the point here is that we may focus that there's kind of a point of serendipity here, the important intellectual work, I think, can be done that operates in its own stream, but it sometimes engages in unpredictable ways with contemporary political debates, public debates. And, and by the way, I think this is an argument for supporting basic research. You know, this is something you never know when this information is going to be useful. And so much to my surprise, I found also that my, my work on, on democracy and the role of the right and the kind of idea that the right itself may be a hinge of democracy uh, speaks to contemporary debates about threats to democracy. And as we think about today's right and Fionn and France and Trump and Brexit and so on, and actually I may have just heard an incredible talk on the role of the EPP and its relationship to Orban and the European Parliament and its kind of role, way in which it's sort of bolstering up uh, Viktor Orban. Um, the point is that suddenly these historical perspectives, I think, become very relevant. And so I hope, uh, I hope, I look forward to hearing what everybody has to say about that. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent, thank you so much, Dan. And now we will go over to Amel. Thank you, um, and thank you for the opportunity to comment on this excellent book. I should say, in the interest of full disclosure, it was unlikely that Daniel was going to write anything that I didn't like a lot. Um, so that was an overly determined outcome. We share a lot of intellectual interest, and we share specifically a concern for a certain set of questions about history and about the history of democracy. And I credit Daniel, along with a group of other uh, pioneering uh, scholars, who have really brought these questions back into the focus of democratization studies. It was not very long ago that it was kind of assumed in the field of democratization studies that these questions about Europe and about historical democratization were essentially settled. We knew how it happened. We knew what, you know, what the what the relevant issues were, um, and this is especially important because these cases, these critical set of cases, have either explicitly or implicitly informed many of our theories of democratization. And it turns out that we had barely even scratched the surface of understanding um, the process of democratization. And so opening these cases up for new theoretical insights and new empirical investigation really opens up lots of opportunities in the field of democratization studies, um, either as correctives for what we understand democratization to be or as paths forward in our theorizing. And here, um, what is undoubtedly you know, a, a very important and novel theoretical contribution is the idea of the two paths and to uh, the, the view of the long durée in, in general. That is moving from discrete events of transition and reversal, you know, democratic transition and democratic breakdown, to viewing long-term paths in which both of these are incorporated. Uh, now, 
this is a challenging thing to do, and there's a reason that people don't often do it. It is a very difficult thing to do empirically. You end up with a you know, fairly long book as a result. Uh, that's not a complaint. This long book is full of lots of great things. Um, but it's also really difficult to do methodologically. How do you connect the dots over a course of two centuries? And how do you do it, most important for me, is how do you do it without descending into a, this very tempting teleology? When you start a history in 1688 and you end with democracy, there is a really strong temptation to you know, produce this overdetermined story um, of, of success and failure. And what I think is one of the more exceptional aspects of this book is that Daniel is able to resist that temptation and walk a very fine line between path dependence and path determination. And so when you look at the case of the United Kingdom, for example, um, where I think there's a serious challenge of, of viewing this case as completely overdetermined from start to finish. Uh, he introduces this really interesting counterfactual. You know, the, in, in the UK, the counterfactual is, could this case have ever failed? And going into it, my answer would have probably been no. I'm not, there's, there's very little that could convince me that the UK was in any danger at any point during this history. But there is a lot of attention devoted to this, and the book is able to provide a very convincing case for a critical juncture in which democracy was actually in danger in the UK. Um, and that ability to unearth those, those uncertainties, I think that's really historical work at its best, and it's one of the things that I value a lot um, in the work. Uh, the, the issue also is identifying continuities. And continuities are really critical in understanding this, this long period of democratization. Because often, you know, with these democratic transitions, our focus immediately goes towards what changes. With any democratic transition, that's, that's, that's the focal point. What has changed and what is the significance of that? But in addition to those changes, there is a lot, a lot that doesn't change over the course of various regime shifts. And so I would... Um, say that the work is not just a theoretical work about democratization, it's a work on <coughs> political change more broadly. And that effort, that, that labor of bringing democracy into the realm of political change, I think is really important theoretical work. Um, another area that I wanted to focus on, and what I think is really a novel theoretical um, contribution of the book, is its conceptualization of party strength and weakness. And this not only is a theoretical contribution for the field of democratization studies and, and, and party system studies, it's also critically important for contemporary politics. And what I think is really you know, fantastic here is the conceptualization of strength and the link to compromise, the ability and willingness of parties to compromise. Um, and so Daniel uh, identifies party weakness with this, you know, Hofstadter referred to as the paranoid style of where, where any sort of compromise is considered non-viable and, and non-attractive. And Daniel, I was also attracted to the exact same quote that you um, pulled out from, I'm gonna actually quote it here, General von Ludendorff. Um, the quote is, with the equal franchise, we cannot live. I would rather an end without terror than a terror without end. It would be worse than a loss at war. And Daniel goes on to say that Germany's conservative party leaders and their allies found themselves in the spiraling grips of a cognitive style in which moral purposes substituted for strategic calculation, no matter the cost. Now, the really important lesson here for me is that compromise in this understanding of, uh, in this conceptualization, compromise is a sign of strength and not weakness, whereas it's often seen as, you know, a, a party that compromises is a weak party. Here it's understood to be a sign of organizational strength and a function of coalition building. So the role of leadership in parties and not just ideology. So ideology plays a role here, but ideology is not the only driving engine in, in, what, in where these parties go. It's coalition building. And I think that's a really important focus for the contemporary context where you find greater and greater polarization and parties both on the right and the left that are unable to build the coalitions that they would need to move back to the center. It's a political calculus in addition to being ideologically motivated and having the organizational base and the strength to promote these uh, moderate coalitions is not an easy thing to come by. Okay, so I'm going to end, as much as I uh, you know, am a complete cheerleader for, for, for the work that Daniel does, I am gonna end on a point of skepticism. Um, and the point it revolves around the role of counter-revolution in stabilizing democracy. Now this is a 
continuing theme throughout the book. And I have to say that, so this is a finding, this is something that I find in my own work. It is analytically, I would say, undeniable that counter-revolution plays a critical role in the stabilization of democracies. And what I mean by counter-revolution is the conservative backlash, mm -hmm. allowing for conservatives to have their say and have um, some way to save some space in, in the political landscape. Every democratic transition deals with this challenge of dealing with those groups who benefited from the previous order. And every successful democratic transition has to find a way of incorporating um, those who you know, are thought of as pro-democratic and those who are thought of as anti-democratic. So analytically, I'm completely with you. The, you know, the, the qualification for me comes at a normative level. How do we make sense of this? If successful democracy requires this counter-revolution, how do we make sense of this normatively? When we consider especially that in some cases, this counter-revolution in the case of the United Kingdom meant the um, complete uh, moderation of labor. In the case of the United States, it meant the exclusion of labor entirely from having a seat at the table. This counter-revolution was not mild. This counter-revolution meant that entire political currents were completely undermined. Now, I completely agree that this was, it played a critical role in stabilizing these democracies and bringing elites on board who otherwise would have probably fought it. But what do, how do we make sense of this? Are these things that need to be corrected at later stages? Do we even have the means to correct for them once we have institutionalized the system as it is? And if they're not corrected, what, is, what does it mean for those affected and what does it mean for our understanding of democracy more broadly? Excellent. Thank you, Alma. David. Great, thank you. Um, it's really a great honor and privilege to be here um, and a pleasure. This is a work that's, um, it's a, I, I applaud Daniel for the, for the intellectual courage to go into a subject like this. I remember five or six years ago I was in uh, Florence and talking with the, the late Peter Mayer um, about work I was doing on Europe, thinking about this book project, not Daniel's, um, but this topic, and he said, you know, there's really nothing left to say. <laughs> um, it's all been written before, and you got three or four different alternative explanations, and you know, you pick one of those, and that's the canon. <laughs> and I mean, in some ways, he was right. I mean, there was no more pressing question in comparative politics in the 50s and 60s than figure out what underlay successful democratization and why Germany went off the rails. And there was an enormous amount of work on it. And the 60s, 70s, and 80s, saw a reaction against a lot of that work, but developed it further. Peter Mayer was right on many things, but he was completely wrong on this. Um, over the last decade, there's been tons and tons of really interesting work um, in, in historical democratization by Amel and, and Daniel. So, um, but let us recognize that this is not easy terrain to either say something new or important in. Um, and in that, the book succeeds magnificently. Three big strengths before I get to the, all of the numerous weaknesses, which is, <laughs> which is why I'm sure everyone has come out you know, today. It's not because they like you and want to celebrate this book, but they, but they have grave concerns about your historiography. <laughs> but the strengths first. Um, this is a new argument, one that you can now put all, 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 alongside uh, works that look at modernization theory or the left or um, middle class parties. This is the work that focuses on the political right and democratization. Doesn't, that doesn't really exist, at least in my mind. So that is an enormous contribution in its own right. The focus on political parties in this period is important as well. I mean, there's most analyses operate at a structural, a class level. Um, and parties haven't been taken as seriously as they should be in this period. And, and Daniel shows why they should. And he shows it through organization, not through ideology or types of parties or the other. But, um, you know, and, and historians, I don't, th or political historians, did not think that maybe organization mattered in this period as much. This was before, really, the rise of mass parties, okay? The Tories and the, and the SPD were starting, yet, you know, there wasn't a lot of organizational dynamics to speak of, or at least one would think, and Daniel shows us that that's, um, that's not correct, and that organizational dynamics were crucially important. There's a beautiful, um, almost at every, within every chapter, um, efforts to come up with data, 
creative uses of data, not in a bad way, not in making it up, but in not running <laughs> out the same data sets, but picking up, particularly the bond markets. All right, I'll just flesh this out because Daniel didn't talk about this. This long debate about how one measures whether elites were afraid that there would be a revolution. Um, and this, is, this variable has never really been even attempt to, to have been measured. In this book, Daniel comes up with this really novel way of doing it. So this is all a long way of saying, if you're working on a topic like this, this book will be a model of really what to do, um, of how to cast an argument and how to proceed through it in, its, in, in, in steps. OK, some, you know, uh, I was worried that maybe Daniel and I wouldn't have a lot of things to talk about when this, when this book came out, but that's not true, um, because there's some historical controversies that I think we can talk about more. None more important than the role of the SPD, which I learned in, the, um, in, in my class with Mary a long time ago. Um, and you know, what about the SPD and the suicide of the democracy? I mean, you really let them off the hook here. I won't say anything more about it because um, I'm running out of time. Turning to Edwardian England, another one of your central cases. I love that you put it in there. Um, and not everybody does. And you rightly call attention to it being a constitutional crisis. Yet you kind of make the case that it was solved in some ways, and I don't really think it was, not only because I'm arguing that right now <laughs> and I'm invested in it, um, but because I also think it happens to be true. Um, I see a England that had not crossed the threshold in many respects in 1914, and I see it as much more of an open question um, than I think you do. Now, if that's true, um, and this brings me to another not complaint or gripe, but um, suggestion, that maybe the gradual narrative that you have is, is, um, is also in a way too, well, too Dalian, too, um, uh, there's something that strikes me, particularly looking at Sweden and some of these other cases, that seem to me not like stepwise progress toward democratization, but rather successful attempts to uh, uh, um, uh, keep all oligarchy intact. So, are we seeing gradualism or are in these cases that you look at in one pattern, I see you know, non-democracies, non uh, I guess to put it most bluntly. But in the, in the 20 minutes I have left now, um, <laughs> <laughs> politics, the, what does this all mean about politics today? I mean, this is, maybe this is why everyone's turning out. Um, I absolutely agree with Daniel's point that the role of the political side the political supply side. So looking at political outcomes not as the automatic processes from large scale, you know, modernization, um, international conflict, what have you, but as the way in which political forces interact at an organizational ideological level. And here the organizational is really important. I absolutely buy the argument and have been making it for a long time that the rise of the far right or radical right, its success in Western Europe is crucially conditioned by the role of mainstream um, political, particularly conservative forces. I think that both Brexit and Trump um, were supply side political, I would call them failures, um, were supply side, came from that rather than from you know, some other way of thinking about, thinking about politics. And I mean, Daniel really, you know, I, I said this on Friday, but you know, um, we were at another similar conference, 15 minutes left. Um, you know, Daniel makes us think, um, thank God for something like the German CDU, maybe not so much the CSU, because that <laughs> is the party that really holds together, right, that prevents the outcomes that Daniel calls attention to, the potential ones. So on the one hand, I think he's absolutely right on this. Yet, I mean, like Amel, I guess I have questions about the possible direction, right? I mean, when is it too far, right? I mean, when do we have Christian democracy being constructed in Italy, right? When is Fidesz, right, conservative party, organizational strength, they could be using their organizational advantage to not become Democrats, but to you know, uh, d erode the democratic system. So is this, does this tell us something about the future, Daniel, at the end of the day? Are we seeing now, in these moments, conservative parties with massive organizational strength that are going to use it to tear down parts of democracy itself? Um, I guess I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to get up only because uh, I had a big lunch and I need to burn some calories. So um, 
Uh, I want to thank uh, Daniel for inviting me to participate in this uh, event and for writing uh, really a wonderful uh, book. Unlike Daniel and the other uh, distinguished scholars on this panel, I'm not an expert in European politics um, and certainly not in European political history. My terrain is much further away and uh, of much more recent uh, vintage. Uh, I work on the contemporary Middle East. Uh, that said, Daniel's actually been one of my most important interlocutors here at Harvard. He has a way of writing and speaking about 19th century and early 20th century Germany that makes it immediately relevant to somebody studying democratic transition in Arabic-speaking Muslim-majority countries or to someone worried about democratic breakdown in a 250-year-old English-speaking democracy between the 49th and 28th parallels. That's a cute way of saying the US. Um, <laughs> I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with Daniel about the parallels between early 20th century German history and early 20th century Egyptian history, nor can I properly express my gratitude for his tolerance of some of my more outlandish comparisons. I remember once, about 10 years ago, coming to him breathlessly with this passage from Weber uh, about Bismarck and his son, and saying, this is exactly like Mubarak and his son. <laughs> and it was a measure of uh, Daniel's scholarly generosity that he kept uh, talking to me after that. I will say, he doesn't, uh, we often have long conversations, he doesn't always take my advice. So for example, I distinctly remember instructing you not to choose this cover for the book, only because, of, what are these guys doing? They look like they're waiting in the waiting room of some, like, uh, London madam or something. But, um, nonetheless, what's, what's, the between the, what's between the covers is what counts. Um, so um, it's really gratifying to me, in fact, given that I work on Egypt, and we've talked a lot about Egypt, to see that a comparison with Egypt in 2011 uh, actually helps to animate this book. In its opening pages, uh, Daniel creates this social scientific category of the unsettled democratic transition, and then he puts my beloved Egypt in the same category as, uh, as his beloved Germany. And so for Middle Easterners who have long wanted to bring our part of the world into the center of comparative politics, this is nothing uh, short of extraordinary. So let me just talk about the argument and what parts of the argument I felt uh, resonated most with me and with my uh, concerns. Because in fact, the argument that Daniel makes speaks to a really old one in the study and practice of politics. And this is really whether establishing a democracy requires the rooting out of the Ancien Regime or its inclusion and accommodation. This is actually one of the most vexing problems that you, you face in any new democracy. In the, study, in the country that I study most closely, Egypt, there was perhaps no topic that inspired more fevered debate than this question of what to do with the old ruling party, the National Democratic Party, and its assorted elite satraps. Do you include them and allow them to participate, or must they be hounded out? Revolutionaries obviously express a desire to purge toppled elites, either in order to achieve justice for wrongs committed during the authoritarian period, or to prevent former autocrats whose normative commitments to democracy and freedom are almost by definition deficient. They want to prevent these people from corrupting the new order from within. On the other hand, you have people of a more pragmatic bent, including a significant number of scholars, including people like me, uh, you know, who argue that, look, the greater threat to a new democracy lies not in the inclusion of former autocrats, but in their exclusion. Because if you hound these people, these pillars of the old regime, in the name of transitional justice, or you otherwise hinder their participation in post-authoritarian politics, then what you're doing is merely guaranteeing the creation of a of a class of spoilers who will engage in counter-revolution, seek to dismantle the new dispensation, often uh, through violence. And there's almost no democracy that has not had to confront this debate. In this democracy, the world's oldest democracy, this was a big question, right? Uh, Kulikov, the historian Alan Kulikov, talks about how people were so upset with loyalists after the revolution, they wanted to expropriate their lands, prevent them from voting. Thomas Jefferson was a big proponent of this, right? He felt that anybody who had sided with the loyalists uh, during the revolution must be even prevented from having the right to vote. On the other side, you had people like Alexander Hamilton, currently the star of an overexposed Broadway musical, who um, 
In a 1784 broadside entitled A Letter from Phocion to the Considerate Citizens of New York on the Politics of the Day, he argued that you know, there were some folks out there who were saying to suffer wealthy and disaffected men to remain among us will be injurious to our liberties, right? So if we don't exclude these people, then they are going to somehow damage our liberty. They will work against us from within. And he said, in fact, no, um, if you want to get them committed to the old order, you've, to the new order, you've got to include them. He said, make it the interest of those citizens who during the revolution were opposed to us to be friends of the new government by affording them not only protection, but participation in its privileges, and they will undoubtedly become its friends. So big debate. And it's not just a practical debate that revolutionaries in Egypt or in 18th century uh, the US had. Uh, it's a debate that exists now. And it's not just about what to do with the old ruling classes. It's really a debate about the importance of democratic norms and values to the genesis maintenance and proper functioning of democracy. So on the one hand, uh, on the one side of this debate are people like Jefferson who, who argue that democracy requires normative commitment on behalf of all of the political elites, right? So if we look at more recent scholarship in this area, Michael McFall in his study of transitions in Eastern Europe says, what matters most is that the powerful are committed to the democratic project where the powerful have, as he says, the upper hand in democratic transitions, where the old elite has the upper hand, um, what you get is protracted confrontation and unconsolidated, unstable, partial democracies and autocracies, more akin to Daniel's sort of unsettled uh, path. Scott Mainwaring, our colleague at the Kennedy School, and Annabel Perez and Lignan offer a similar argument. They contend that democracy is more likely to emerge and survive if the most powerful actors have a normative preference for democracy. That is, if they believe that democracy is intrinsically the best political regime, even if it doesn't satisfy all of their other policy preferences. So this is one powerful argument. Um, and on this telling, right, the fact that conservative politi- oh my god, I really, I have like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm following the David Art School of time management. Um, <laughs> I can so, get away with it. On, 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 on this telling, the fact that conservative parties like the kind of the kind that Daniel is uh, talking about, these parties are composed of elites who, after all, have this revealed preference for authoritarianism. If it, then, what we should expect is that these types of parties, the inclusion of these types of parties, should actually constitute a risk factor for uh, d uh, democratic breakdown. Uh, in fact, the stronger and more electorally potent these parties are, the more dangerous it should be. And, and Daniel's not arguing that, right? So on the other side of this debate are people like Daniel, or who I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to say you're not on this side of the debate, um, um, who are like the Alexander Hamiltons of the world, right? These are the people who said that values aren't as important as interests, right? So people, I think in this class, people uh, in this class of scholars, people like Dankort Rustow or O'Donnell and Schmitter, or most importantly Terry Carl, right? Who said Terry Carl says political democracies generally arise from a compromise between organized uh, elites that are unable to impose their will, and more importantly, she says you're most likely to get democracy, at least in her Latin American cases. Um, when the old regime has the upper hand. She says, no stable political democracy has resulted from regime transitions in which mass actors have gained control even momentarily. So Daniel's argument is actually very consistent, uh, or at first blush would seem to be very consistent with Terry Carl's argument. Because like others in this elite and interest-centric school, he is saying that strong ancient regimes, if they have strong political parties, that helps to make strong democracies, despite the fact that the normative commitments of these conservative parties uh, may be suspect. However, I think where your argument really differs from those uh, people um, is, um, is, in fact, I think you think norms really matter. Um, and so the, where the argument differs, so Carl and others say that the primary benefit of having these strong um, uh, conservative or old elite parties participate in politics is that it prevents them from becoming spoilers. Right? It prevents them from uh, uh, deciding to try to bring down a democracy if they're not included. Whereas Daniel's mechanism is different. It's not about preventing them from becoming spoilers. Uh, what Daniel argues is that having these strong parties 
allows us to have a firewall against more extreme challengers from the right. And that seems to me a very different argument and one that is uh, highly consequential. In other words, in Daniel's story, these conservative parties aren't contentless, right? Um, you know, in order for them to serve their democracy promoting function, they must be moderate. That is, they must actually have some commitment to democracy. Um, and so the importance of this, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to wrap this up quickly. Um, yeah. The importance of this comes through most clearly in uh, the chapters uh, retelling the collapse of the Weimar Republic, and this is chapters eight and nine. And in these chapters, basically the whole thing comes down to a decision by the leader of the principal conservative party, uh, the Deutsche National Volkspartei, this Donald Trump-like figure uh, called Alfred Hugenberg, right? So in January of 1933, President von Hindenburg says to him, listen, are you gonna sign on to this plan to make Hitler the chancellor at the head of a uh, coalition government? And according to Daniel, Hugenberg and his party, they hold about 7% of the seats in the Reichstag, and they are the veto player, right? If they decide, not to go along with this, then crisis may have, be, have been averted and uh, German uh, democracy might have lived another day, although I think just one other day. I mean, there were, mel you know, this is going <laughs> to fail. Um, um, and anyway, according to Daniel, he says, Hugenberg agrees to the plan because basically he's as much an anti-Semite and uh, um, radical as Hitler is. Um, and in fact, you know, he talks about how his party had formed an alliance with Hitler. And so for Daniel, really where it all goes wrong is when Hugenberg and his allies seize the, the main conservative party from its more moderate leadership in the late 1920s. If that hadn't happened, if the DNVP's traditional elites had actually managed to build a strong party, had proven more adept at party organization and at taming uh, their base, then they would have been able to keep Hugenberg from taking over the party. And then when von Hindenburg comes and asks them to sign on to Hitler becoming the chancellor, they would have said, no, none doing. And then we wouldn't have gotten uh, Nazi uh, Germany. But this actually raises a really important uh, question. The question for us is, why were these old DNVP elites uh, more committed to, to democracy than Hugenberg and his, rally, uh, and his rabble, right? So you say that the uh, conservative elites actually didn't like Hugenberg. They said that he was going to make their party coalitions unsfähig, which means like not suitable for polite company. And according to Daniel, they were, they were worried about the, uh, these uh, rabble because they were more electorally minded than the radicals, right? So in your view, the conservatives were, mo were more elected or electorally minded. But given where German politics and public opinion were going, this actually seems a puzzling argument to me. It seems to me that more electorally minded politicians during this period would have read the currents of German public opinion and responded by embracing not resisting the anti-Semitism, the Volkish uh, sensibilities, and the anti-liberalism that the Nazi party was peddling. The fact that they didn't do that suggests that to me, for some of these leaders at least, the commitment to democracy was more than just pragmatic. It was deeply ingrained and deeply held, even at deep personal political cost. And so what we need is an account of where that comes from. Um, so um, I, I have a, a story which I will not tell, um, but basically I think this is important because it also uh, raises a question about the dismal policy prescription at the end of this book, right? So dismal is your, your term for it. So Daniel says that the price that Democrats must pay in, 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 for democracy is a quote, organizationally strong and well endowed conservative political party that at least has some chance of winning. And then he invokes Egypt uh, as a way of illustrating this, right? And he says that where that country's democratic transition went wrong is when the Egyptians dissolved the National Democratic Party and ended up writing a constitutional article that banned the old party's leaders and former parliamentarians for, from political participation for a, a number of years. And certainly this is consistent with uh, my own view. But actually on reading Daniel's book, I'm not sure that uh, his prescription follows from uh, all the history he shared or that I was right. Because if conservative parties um, 
only serve a democracy promoting function insofar as they themselves are moderate or committed to democracy, it's not clear to me actually that allowing the NDP to continue to participate in Egyptian politics, even if that were a possibility, um, it's not clear to me that that would have aided the cause of democratic government in that country. In fact, the more I think about it inspired by this book, uh, the more I think that the central tragedy of Egyptian politics was the absence of actors like uh, Schlesemann or uh, uh, what's that guy, the Oscar, uh, his last name starts with an H, um, people who actually um, believed in democracy. There was nobody uh, on the Egyptian political spectrum, whether they're uh, Islamists or non-Islamists, conservative or liberal, who were well and truly committed to democratic inclusive government. And the puzzle for me is that in Egypt, we didn't have Weimar-like levels of inflation and instability to explain it. So I began these remarks by noting Daniel's patience with my tortured Egypt-Weimar comparisons, and now I'm ending with uh, just such a comparison. Let me just conclude by reminding everybody here what an extraordinary achievement this book is. It is an incredible scholarly edifice, and I'm certain that I'm not the only scholar of the Middle East or of the developing world more broadly who's going to find his or her research agenda immeasurably enriched by this provocative uh, and deeply impressive text. Thank you, Daniel, for writing this. And Yasha, over to you. Well, these are some tough acts to follow. Um, uh, I, I'm not going to, uh, in part because I don't want to, you know, have to be compared to the others in the panel, I'm not going to uh, follow the standard uh, book launch protocol. So I'm not going to start by uh, praising uh, Dan, but uh, in compensation, I'm also not going to finish by criticizing him. <laughs> um, <laughs> instead, what I want to do is really to think out loud about, um, you know, the incohates thought that I had reading the book, which were all very much about this particular political moment. Uh, that's partially because it's difficult to think of anything else at the moment, um, and partially because that's what I'm working on, but it's mostly because uh, the book does naturally invite um, such rich resonances to figuring out the ways in which uh, it can be our guide to this particular political moment um, and the ways in which perhaps it can't be. I mean, I think that, that it's a generally open question. There are obvious, uh, there's obvious questions that the, this book invites about how much danger we're in right now. But there's also obvious disanalogies. And so I just want to sort of um, share with you that thought process I had uh, when I was reading the book, and I really haven't come to a conclusion yet, um, but I hope that perhaps um, that can be part of what our conversation is about. Um, so, you know, the core of the argument, as I think it's emerged very clearly on this panel as well, is that it really matters whether conservative parties are able to hold extremes in check, and, and, and a big part of that is how much... Um, sort of autonomy they have, to what degree they feel empowered to hold those extremes in check, and that obviously, as Tarek was just bringing out, also means that they that can't themselves become captured by it. If the leadership of a mainstream party itself becomes radical, then it can't keep the radicals out. Um, now, in a very straightforward way, that is extremely worrying for today. You see conservative parties be increasingly weak and increasingly radical. When you think about Donald Trump capturing the Republican Party, that comes from a number of things. It comes, first of all, from the fact that political scientists were very wrong when they claimed that the party decides in the name of a famous book in political science of the last few years, because clearly the traditional Republican Party elites did not decide. Otherwise, Donald Trump would not have been their candidate and would not have been president of the United States. But there's also a sort of second level of comparison here, um, which is that actually the Republicans themselves have become more and more radical over the last years, have uh, engaged in many forms of not just racist dog whistling, but even of sabotage of democratic institutions. Um, when I was speaking here last week, I mentioned uh, the gubernatorial elections in North Carolina and the way in which a non-Trumpist Republican legislature ended up rewriting the rules of what the governor gets to do after the election, the outgoing Republican legislature, because the Democrat was elected governor. That represents an unwillingness to be bound by the basic rules of a democratic game. So I think that there is an obvious parallel here, not just uh, between the organizatorial weakness of a lot of German parties and the DNVP, 
but also of a rightward drift of a lot of the Republican Party leadership. The DNVP and Hugenberg read like very contemporary figures when you go through Dan's book. Now, there's a European dimension to this as well, even though in many ways European conservative parties, you might think, are organizatorily stronger. They don't seem to be uh, empowered to draw clear lines. Um, I'm frankly puzzled as to why uh, Viktor Orban's Fidesz party is still a member of the EPP, of the family of conservative and Christian democratic parties in the European Parliament, including the CDU, which uh, somebody just suggested we should thank. In general, I think when you look at German politics, that's right. But at the European level, the CDU is now aiding and abetting the destruction of democracy in Hungary. And I, I need to understand more about the current organizatorial and ideological weakness of European conservative political parties to understand why that's possible. But again, it's something that seems to be a clear parallel and becomes all the scarier in the light of Dan's very convincing argument. Now, I would add something else, which is that uh, the, the, the focus of this is on conservative parties and the way in which they are or are not able to sort of domesticate um, traditional uh, elites. But of course, one thing that successful democracies in Europe also had in common was very powerful and well-organized and successful left-wing democratic parties. And that perhaps becomes a little bit of a question as to when you cut off the book. If you run Britain longer than 1918, then the role of labor becomes more prominent than when you cut it off in 1918. But, but the point is that on the left side as well, there were parties who were able to contain extremes in countries like Britain, and there weren't parties who were able to contain extremes in countries like Germany. And I'd love to think a little bit more about what the role of that is, especially because that is incredibly pressing now. What you see even more clearly than a weakness of conservative parties, especially in Europe, is a weakness of mainstream left-wing parties. Mm. Um, we're now uh, six days from an election in France where uh, it's very clear, the one thing that we know, we don't know anything about how the election is going to go, and I'm looking at Art Goldhammer um, because he's my guide to all of this. Um, the one thing we know is that there's not going to be a representative of a Parti Socialiste in the second round of the election. The one thing we know in Britain is that under current leadership, the Labour Party is not going to be in government of the next elections. But one thing we've seen in the Netherlands, which has been celebrated as a great success because um, Gerd Wilders only increased his vote share somewhat, <laughs> is that the Social Democratic Party plummeted from 30 to about 6% in the vote. Right? So if you also need a strong left-wing political party in order to hold democracy together, then we're now uh, facing a real problem. So... <coughs> That's the worrying story. I mean, there are also some obvious disanalogies between the period that Dan looks at and our period. Um, uh, and I'm going to just float them in a minute. Um, the first is a very different starting point. Right? One of the reasons, Dan argues, why it is so important for conservative parties to have this agency is that they have to do something especially difficult, which is to take a historically extremely privileged group but has the most to lose from democracy and try and get them accommodated to democracy. Um, and obviously this is also a group that is culturally set against democracy because these are countries that don't have a deep democratic tr tradition. So in those situations, we're facing a different situation. It's not clear, you know, when you think of the kinds of groups which conservative parties or even left-wing parties would have to bind to democracy now, they don't have as straightforward a stake in a prior regime form or prior set of property relations as was true in 19th century Europe. And so that might be reassuring, that perhaps uh, uh, you don't need a strong conservative party because there isn't the underlying challenge in quite the same way that was the case uh, then. Um, and so perhaps actually what you need to hold in check is, uh, you know, speaking of, of, of a normative of very interesting normative implications. I'm going to put my political theorist head on for the last 20 seconds. Um, the very interesting normative implication that you have to live with some amount of imperfect imperfection. That the things that my sort of flaw of sieges likes to do, which is to think of ideal theory, 
is uniquely unhelpful because if you're just thinking about what the most just kind of society would be and you're just trying to impose that, you'll actually wind up with something even worse because there's very powerful people um, whom you have to compromise with or they just destroy the whole thing. So perhaps the question becomes, who are those people today? Um, and there's different spins on that. I mean, it might be that those are people who are unwilling to live in a multi-ethnic society and you have to think about how to um, make certain compromises that are very normatively difficult towards them. Or it might be something about uh, the capitalist class. I don't know exactly what the equivalence would be. Um, so I guess just in, in closing, uh, I found this book to be phenomenally thought-provoking. Um, and I think there's a number of very obvious and scary parallels between the time period that Dan is thinking about and, and now. Um, but there's also some potentially reassuring disanalogies, and, and, and I'm really only starting to think through those, but I know that the book will stay on my mind as I think through those questions in the coming months. Thank you, Asher. So Dan, I'd like to close with one thought of my own and then give you, if you'd like, a chance to, obviously you can't respond to everything, but if you'd like to say a few words, and then we will go to you, to the audience, for a conversation on these themes, so start thinking of your questions. The a question I have for you draws out of the conclusion to your book, which, which it struck Tarek and it also struck me as well. You say at the end of the book, quote, in simplest terms, this study has argued that the price that advocates of democracy must pay is that the propertied and powerful not only have a diffuse but disproportionate influence on society all the time, but also that it be protected by organizationally strong and well-endowed political parties that have the chance of winning elections at least some of the time. And that seems to me to be something of both historical and contemporary resonance. And I'm wondering, uh, this is something, I had the privilege of having lunch with some of the participants in this panel beforehand, and we were talking about the way that this book tells the story of conservative parties and the birth of democracy, because there is so much excellent scholarship on parties of the left and the birth of democracy. I would just be interested in hearing a little bit more from you about whether these parties are acting in a way that is reactive to parties of the left pushing for more democracy, and they are, as you say, coming to a, a reluctant position that they, they have to respond to that, and if they do so with, as you said, organizationally strong and well-endowed and well -endowed parties, then they will be able to exercise, quote, a diffuse but disproportionate influence in this new era. So is this reactive and figuring out the next best alternative to, to, to dominance, or is this seizing the initiative in some ways? So I'd be interested in hearing more from you about the interaction between the right and the left uh, in the birth of democracies. And then, as I said, any other comments that you would like to make with regard to the questions or comments of the panel? Great. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for great comments. Um, um, you're all my friends in different ways, and now you're all, you know, so I'm, I really uh, appreciate the, the, the kind reading and thoughtful comments as well. Um, I, get, I, I won't, re of course, respond to everything, because I would like to hear what other people have to say, but um, uh, just, I guess, two, two big thoughts I have. One on the kind of normative implications of the argument, because in some ways it sounds like I'm really, you know, a real reactionary here, um, <laughs> you know, as, de as described by you guys. And, I, and, the way, and the way I think about, you know, so this, this, this uh, line that Mary just read comes on the last page, and I say, you know, this is not a conclusion I intended to come to at the beginning of this project, but I kind of ended up here. Um, and I think one way of thinking about this is that I do think that what, it, what you read is correct. You know, sounds great. Uh, um, but I think I would like to make a distinction because one, the idea that the regime should have, the old regime should have the upper hand, which is what Tara kind of cited Terry Call. I, and that's not, that, that's not the kind of full, that doesn't exhaust my argument because I think there's, the, the key point is that there's different ways for the old regime to have the upper hand. And there's some ways that are more destructive and more democratic and some ways, or in some ways that are more democratic. And so the way that people have often thought about this is that in order, and going, you know, and there's a big, big debates in democratization, O'Donnell Schmitter and others, Terry Call, that in order for democracy to stick, you need to include a set of institutions in place that kind of buy off the old elite, allow the military in Chile extra, you know, veto power over their budgets, or you know, carve out, un, you know, unelected seats for certain key powerful groups. I very much think those are bad ideas. Um, these kind of institu constitutional, counter-majoritarian hardwiring of these advantages to one group or over another, I think are inferior to what I'm proposing. Uh, 
both normatively and empirically. What I, what I would like to argue is that party organization is a kind of softer buffer. It's a kind of way of protecting old regime elites in a way that's much more compatible normatively with democracy and also, I think, stick and are more effective. So for every, you know, so people will sometimes say, that, you know, the British House of Lords helped Britain democratize because it's easy to expand the suffrage when there was this extra check there in place. You know, but for every British House of Lords, there's a Prussian House of Lords. And the Prussian House of Lords blocked democratization. It didn't, you know, there was many checks in the German political system, and yet elites were still fearful. So these counter-majoritarian constitutional checks restrict the room for competition, and they often maybe don't even work. I think political parties, what, what's kind of interesting about political parties is that what they, by, by using parties as a buffer to protect old regime elites or anti-democratic forces in a broader context, as long as there's a viable opposition, this is a, there's a kind of ratcheting effect on democratic competition where both sides now compete. And so, you know, in the 19, early 1920s, when the uh, British Conservative Party broke away from the, the wartime coalition with the liberals, they then were facing a labor party, and they, were, and they embraced this competition because they thought, you know, they wanted to squeeze out the liberal party and face a labor party, and they thought they could win. And the result of this then was vibrant competition between labor, you know, over the next century and conservatives. Conservatives maybe won most of the time, but you now had a vibrant, real cons labor party. So this may be imperfect. You know, maybe I wish, personally, labor had won more of the time. But this is better than having had a constitutional check in place that restricts the room for competition. So, I, so in a way, I'm making a kind of democratic case for these, counter, for, these, for these kind of softer buffer institutions as being normatively and empirically superior to the kind of traditional counter-majoritarian checks that we often think uh, are so useful. But I, you know, I, you know, I haven't really seen actually a study that convinces me that these were as important as people tend to think they were. So, that, so this also gets a bit to Amal's point as well about the normative counter-revolution. It sort of depends on what form the counter-revolution takes. And I think it can take more productive ways and less productive ways. Um, I, I might leave it there, but I'll just one last thing is, you know, in terms of the role of the left, you know, the, the German case is very instructive. So, you know, in some ways one might argue, well, part of the reason the German conservatives were so scared is because they were facing more radical leftists in Germany than the British conservatives were facing a moderate, you know, Methodist labor party, and these guys were very polite and so on. And so it was much easier for them to not be so resistant. But I, but I think it turns out the causal error goes the way, other way around. Instead of, I mean, I tend to not want to blame the left for the sins of the right. I think the, the right is the, is the, these are the power holders in society. These are the first movers. And it was the strategies of the right in Germany that radicalized the left in Germany. Mm -hmm. And so there's a key point in 19, the Karl Shorsky book, on the Great Schism and, and the German left, you know, where the, we sort of have the beginning of the divide between the German communists and social democrats. This divide, I mean, as Shors Shorsky's analysis makes clear, I think, that the divide, the final kind of straw that broke the camel's back was a failure of the reform of the three-class voting system. So it was a failure for, of the right to liberalize that provoked a schism on the left in which the radical left said, you know, forget this. We're, we've had enough of trying to play this kind of moderate game. We're just going to, you know, try to overturn the system at all costs. And so there's a way in which I think the right is the first mover in this game. Um, and you get the left that you get based on the kind of right that you have. Mm -hmm. So this is maybe my own, you know, I, so I tend to want to, so I tend to think let's not blame the outsiders, let's blame the insiders for the, the nature of the political system. This gets a bit, I think, also to Yasha's yeah. points. So I have a lot more to say, but I'll, I'll stop Excellent. There. Yeah. All right. Well, what I will do, I can see a lot of people ask questions already. I will note uh, when I see your hand go up and uh, then call on people in that order. So once I've nodded at you, you don't have to keep your hand up. We are recording this for all of the people who couldn't come inside from the sunshine. No, I mean have important classes that they're teaching. So since it's being recorded, we ask that you please wait for the microphone and that you identify yourself. And if you could please keep your questions brief so that we can get as many in as possible. So Professor Temkin over there had the first question and that will be followed by this gentleman in the front row, first front row, and then our gold hammer after that. All right. Uh, Dan, I can't wait to, to, to read this book. Um, I, I had actually two, uh, uh, maybe three brief questions, and I think we finished. The first question is about what, what is conservatism over time? So it seems to me that the, the term is used for all kinds of right-wing phenomena and parties uh, to the point where if you take a macro look, conservatism is, is, is just is nothing more than an, often than a, than a name. And just to give a, a brief example, if you 
uh, think about even the Conservative Party in Britain. We have, you know, since Thatcher, I'm not even sure if it's a Conservative Party. It seems like a rat, some kind of radicalism that entered into. It. So even how do you think about that that question about Conservative versus other kinds of right wing uh, politics in you know in your in your framework? The second uh, question briefly is about this idea that several of you spoke about, the commitment to democracy. So over time, you might argue there are um, many people in politics in Europe for whom participation in democracy is uh, under the, uh, the assumption or expectation that this is a way to attain power. Uh, for others, it's the way to survive. But in fact, there are many participants in a democratic system who don't seem to be committed really to democracy um, except as a kind of instrument of their own. Um, so uh, even if we think about you know, the example of the, the Republican Party in the United States, it seems to me that for many of these people, democracy is simply something that keeps them um, in power. Once they're not in power, the commitment to democracy drops. That's not just a, a Republican invention. I think this is true. Uh, of, of many cases, so how deep really is the commitment to, to democracy and how, how normative is it rather than simply an instrument? Um, and then last and brief question connected to this one, um, there seems to be a little bit of underestimating of the left going on, uh, not normatively or in terms of value, but if you think about Marxism, socialism, and then com communism, these were significant um, things. Uh, and they were playing games, right? They, and there the commitment to democracy was very problematic even when they were participating in democracy, right? So to what extent is, maybe to echo Mary a little bit, but in a more uh, radical way, I suppose, to what extent is right-wing politics or conservative politics uh, sort of a politics of fear of rev revolution, uh, communist revolution specifically, not just sort of the, you know, the power of, uh, of the left more, more broadly? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, do you want to take on that question? Uh, maybe get one more, but I have, I mean, I would like to answer this. Uh, but I, then the gentleman down here up was next. Yeah. And if you could identify yourself. Sure, I'm Dan Smith, Assistant Professor of Government uh, here at Harvard. Uh, thanks, Dan and all the panelists for an interesting uh, conversation. I had a sort of two-part question. One is, so the, the, the term, I guess this is in the book and I haven't read it yet, but I'm looking forward to it, a, uh, a party that is uh, organizationally strong and well endowed, right? That came out uh, a lot. Um, my first question is, where does that come from? You use it as an explanatory variable, but it could just as easily be an outcome variable, or it could be an intervening variable. And so I wonder if you could say something about uh, whether you've thought about or, or you deal with the determinants of, of that organizationally strong and well-endowed party emerging and whether it's more likely to emerge in different contexts than others. Uh, the second question on that definition is, what does organizationally strong and well-endowed <laughs> really mean? Uh, so uh, uh, operationalizing that in some kind of way, I guess it's a measurement question. How do you, how do you define uh, organizationally strong and well-endowed? And relating that to the, the comment that's come up several times about Trump and the Republican Party, um, my sense would be the Republican Party is organizationally stronger and more well endowed today than it has ever been in its history. And the 16 candidates who ran the primary uh, with Trump would be a reflection of that. They all just had different pockets of support from different well endowed uh, uh, you know, constituencies within the Republican Party. And they split the vote so that Trump was able to get uh, momentum early on with something like 25% support in the Republican Party. So in some ways, Trump's rise in the Republican Party could be a reflection of a very strong, but organizationally diffuse, not hierarchically organized party. So I wonder if you can uh, reflect yeah. on that. And I should say that also the other panelists should feel free to jump in as well if something really speaks to your, your work as well. But we'll give Dan the, the, the privilege of starting. Um, well, so let me let me just start. Yeah, thanks for the the good questions. I mean, on Dan's last point, I mean, I think it's useful to think of the Republican Party actually. The, in term, you know, so I have a I have a table in here where I lay out all the dimensions and so on of how what a what a strong party means. And um, you know, one of the, the the but the way I think about it, the Republican Party, what the example you give of everybody having their own billionaire to fund them, um, is a sign of a weak party according to my definition. In the sense that, so I I have a, in a sense a kind of Huntingtonian sense in terms of Samuel Huntington's sense of institutionalization, in which one of the thing one of the def, definitions of of effective organization is autonomy. So in other words, a party that 
has a monopoly on the nomination process, and it has a monopoly on funding as well. And so it has its own sources of funding. And so if a party is an, is an autonomous organization, autonomous from interests and groups, then it's a strong organization. If, a, if an organization, Samuel Huntington was kind of obsessed with the word capture. He had, his first, his dissertation I think was on capture. His famous book, Political Orders and Capture, there's this great story, it's a side note, but there's this great, this great interview with him in which he, he argued against doing field research for comparatives. He said you get captured by your case if you studied it for too long. So, but I kind of share the, the concern when it comes to organizations, not to field work, which is that the way in which an, if an organization is not autonomous and you have outside sources of funding. So, you know, why the US Republican Party has has ended up in a situation where, I mean, you can track, and for my new book, I'm tracking over time the number of candidates running, the number of uh, outsiders running, so people who have never held elected office, which is, this is all increasing. The party itself is kind of a shell, or increasingly a shell organization in some sense, in terms of both control and the fact that the party leaders didn't want Trump to win, and yet he won, means they didn't have control over the nomination process. This is really the first, I mean, you know, maybe Jimmy Carter was a bit of an outsider, but not to the same degree. So, so the inability to control the nomination process, control the funding process, these things go together. And in my mind, these are signs of a weak party. So it's, so I'm, it's, and I, I elaborate it's this more. Presidentialism versus parliamentarism. Yeah, too, right? that's right. But, you know, this is right. That, so that contributes to it. And I think, you know, there's things that contribute to it. The rise of new forms of media, the new, new fin forms of fin campaign financing. The rising income inequality and the increased number of billionaires. Every candidate can have their own billionaire. I mean, these things may drive part of this kind of loosening of what the party does. Um, so that, that's just a, a way of kind of getting to that. In terms of the first question, I mean, so the, I mean, I guess I'll just have to encourage you to buy the book. I have several chapters on where, the, where conservatives come from, and there's a kind of account of how this, um, it really has to do with the structure of religious cleavages in some ways, and that if the right is homogeneous conf confessionally, either not split along church-state issues or is not split between confessions, Protestant ca Catholicism. So one of the key interesting things about the British Conservative Party is I make the case that they were in some sense a defender of the Anglican Church. They relied on, a co the landed elites were Anglican and so this was their base. And so religious homogeneity for the right serves as a key factor. There's some other factors that I elaborate as well. Um, so, yeah, but those, those are good questions. In terms of Moshek's uh, question about what is conservatism, I, I really would like to address that because that's sort of a key point. I mean, so there's different ways to think about what is conservatism. Um, you know, one, one definition is the defense of the status quo. You know, but the status quo is always changing. So what you were previously criticizing, you're now defending. So that's not very uh, useful. Uh, the way people who study conservative parties, comparativists who study this often will say is that it's about who the core, it's about the ideology you can certainly identify key features of the ideology, but it's often defined sociologically by which people mean who is the core constituency. But that itself, I find that not very satisfactory because that changes over time, as you say. And so the way I deal with this issue in this book is to say, who did the, who did the party represent at its founding moment? And so if the party represented these, the key groups that I identify as, as the, constituting the old regime, so economic elites, political elites, those connected to the upper strata of the state, establishment church institutions. If these were the core founders of a political party, these were the core constituency at the founding moment, the party then changes and evolves over time. And eventually, you know, the British Conservative Party today may not bear much resemblance to its origin. But my, the kind of, the, the notion, I guess, is that a founding moment leaves an imprint on an organization. And the, the challenge then for a party that has its founding um, and kind of at the upper strata of society is to try to win elections, majority elections, where you, you, your core constituency is not a majority. This presents something that I call the conservative dilemma, where how do you, if you're defenders of the up, upper classes and, up, and most powerful elements in society, how do you win democratic elections? And this is a particular dilemma that parties of the right at their founding face, and they go through lots of efforts to kind of expand their base, and this then poses dilemmas for the party. How do you make, stay true to your base while appealing to new constituencies? And that this particular dynamic is something that's unique to conservative parties. Over time, certainly they change. But I think a kind of broader point I would make, and this, I guess, also gets to Yasha's earlier point about you know the starting points are different. I, mean, I tend to think of, I, th I mean, we have this tendency to, to think about our current moment as sort of the end point of history. You know, this is where we are now is where we'll end up. And then we try to look for historical analogs. Are we like where we were? But you know, instead of thinking about you know we're in we're in these kind of long trajectories. You know, and Trump is like a transitional figure. You know, and so you know, so what comes next, and how do we even think about these 
you know, uh, you know what, how do we think about these long-run trajectories? And so if, you know, the, the, what I'm describing are these, this process where conservatives came out of this particular historical context, but they face certain kinds of dilemmas, and they, the dilemmas change over time. But you know, they, there are certain resonances, and, and I guess that's the most I would push for. I mean, sort of analogies. I mean, the, you know, that's, not, that's kind of a lo loose language, but I think it helps kind of pose new questions. You know, you can't draw direct lessons. But I think the dilemmas are often very similar. And so that, that's sort of how I would think, think about that. Yeah, actually, this picks up on another issue we were discussing before the yeah. panel. Is this, uh, I, I mean, I'm glad you brought this up, Dan, the mistaken idea that we are at the end point of history. Mm -hmm. If you look at some of these issues in the ancient world, uh, it's clear that democracies were very fragile constructs. And um, you know, there was something, I mean, obviously the evidence is incomplete, but there was something on the order of you know, two dozen democracies in Athenian city-states, and they did not last long. The outlier was Athenian democracy, which just about managed 200 years, and that was it. And uh, if you look over the millennia of history, you very much see a story of flux where democracies don't last. So I think that one of the important aspects of your work and of this discussion is that we not fall under the sway of that assumption that somehow we've reached an end state and our democracy is just going to maintain itself in perpetuity. No. <laughs> and that's both a historical and a contemporary point. Uh, I don't know if any of you would like to chip, jump in at this point. Well, David? Sure. I, a, a few things to say on Trump since he's been referred to. I, it's tough to know what to read from this. I mean, it's really, really difficult. Um, did the party decide, and, or did the party not decide, and it was an organizational failure? I mean, one, we have to recognize that the Republican Party used every single organizational lever it could. Except right? for superdelegates. Except for, well, try, but look, you, you, cannot, you cannot say that organizational efforts were not underway, and Cruz was the best organized of them all, right? So it's not to say that they didn't attempt to do this. And had he lost, which was a legitimate possibility three days before, what would the post-election commentary have been other than a lot of other things? Trump's massive organizational failure, inability to open all, in all these various precincts, constituencies in Ohio led to this, or, or whatever state was critical. So he was criticized as you know, not using organization in this way. So it could have looked very, very different. I think what didn't work, so to speak, was the vetting. And this is what Daniel really focuses on. It was the Republican Party's inability to vet Trump. And what I mean by that is, um, well, it's, I, I guess it's sort of obvious that, that this is a figure who looks very similar to radical right politicians in Europe, almost identical, um, but was allowed or able to, you know, to, to become president. Why did it fail? I mean, I think there's some answers here. It could be that organization doesn't really matter like we think it does. And that's possible, right? Maybe there are things about the new media environment, whatever, that, you know, that, that that's, you can go into the, why this might be so. It could be that that's the Southern strategy, right? And that Republicans were unable to vet because the Southern strategy was a decision made at one point in time and could not get away from it at the end of the day. As one, uh, an, another possibility, and I think this we should t think about more, is the too many candidate problem, similar to France in 2002. It's not going to be France this year, the presidential election, but too many candidates splitting the vote, not coordinating among themselves, not showing organization there. I think that's a, you know, a, a, another significant possibility. But it's, it's the vetting at the end of the day that didn't work, and maybe not the organizational piece, presence or absence, um, my view. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to uh, add something on the issue of normative commitments, which I think is a really important theme that's come up. I, so I think I, I see things a little differently here, which is that the normative commitments came and went. So what makes, uh, what makes it po possible for Salisbury to say one thing and then completely shift gears decades later shows us that this was a moving target. And there is, so my personal take is that there is no politician so magnanimous that they would inaugurate a system in which their view of politics is going to be annihilated. Um, it, so they, they will concede to things in which they individually might lose seats, but to eliminate that way of, so, so to eliminate conservatism entirely would have been difficult. So I actually, I think even among the liberals here, and especially among the liberals, the liberals were the ones who you know, were at the head of the, the revolution in the UK, and then when they realized that they were going to lose all this ground, they're the ones who led the counter-revolution. 
So it came from the right and the left. So I don't actually think that the normative commitment needs to be there uh, as, as, as entrenched as, as some, some might think. And that could be, you know, the instrumentalism here, that could be a good sign for contemporary democracies. So, so Tarek, you made the point that, you know, in, in transitional uh, Egypt, there were no Democrats. I think that is probably correct. Uh, but I think a potentially bigger problem is that there were no leaders and there was no one who was willing to make compromises or convince others that those compromises had to be made. Um, so this kind of style of politics, and, and I know that, you know, I, I've not studied Egypt nearly as much as Tariq has, but I know that, you know, I'm, I'm in touch with a lot of people who were um, heading up different advocacy groups and different organizations at the time of the transition, and this was a recurring question. Is it okay to compromise? And without leadership at the top saying that, yes, this is, this is not a, you know, this is not a um, desecration of your ideology. This is actually how we get things in place. This is how we pass policies. Without that kind of leadership in place, um, those, the, the, the ability to hold that political order together really is, is weak. Can I, can I just say something on exactly on this? Because I did, Mushik asked also this question about the norm, how, commit, how deep must the norms, the commitment to democracy be in order for this to work? And you know, I, I'm, that's, you know, my answer to that change is in flux, I think. I mean, when I wrote this book you know, over the last several years, my view was very much that, that really what this book is in part about is the transformation and the kind of political leaders that one has. And so, one, so the, this shift from the politics of ultimate ends, as Weber described it, to a much more instrumental view of politics. And so I view that as a good thing. And so in particular, the rise of a profession of politics. I mean, this is a Weberian view of this, but you know, I actually track these guys who are professional party agents who have to take an exam for the conservative party. They have their own pension fund. They, it's a very, you know, they, they are member, if you pass the exam, you get to advise elections. And these guys have a skill set as measured by these tests. They have a financial investment and this continuation of democracy. And so I always kind of joke that Karl Rove would be a disaster. You know, he wouldn't survive a military coup. He's making a killing, you know, he was. I guess I don't know what he's doing these days. But at some point, he was making a killing in the world of democratic politics. Having a set of democratic skills as a, as a form, this is a kind of rationalist account of this, it provide a set of investments and sunk costs in the continuation of democratic politics. And, I get, and this involves, you know, people knowing how to compromise and people realizing that, you'll, you know, you will lose today, we may win tomorrow. And you know, having the skills to be confident in that, and then also having a kind of their own economic livelihood tied up in it. And so I think that transformation, the degree to which politicians become instrumental and transactional, is a great development, especially for conservatives. I mean, maybe on the left as well. I haven't studied that. But for conservatives who at some point were true believers, like Ludendorff, opposed to democracy at all costs, to be, you know, to, to, if you substitute for that people who are willing to play the democratic game even though they don't really believe in it, I've always thought that's a great development. I have to admit now, though, that I have begun to sort of question that. You know, I think living through the United States today, I suddenly have used, you know, hear the word norm mm -hmm. and use the word norm much more than I ever have. And I kind of wonder how deep is that. I think what I've described is real, and I think it matters, but, I, but I'm not sure how powerful that on its own actually is. Tarek wants to jump in. So, you know, I, I um, have never believed that normative commitment was important. So in all of my <laughs> work, I always say, and I tell my students, for example, look, I say, I, Apropos of Karl Rove, I give the example of Karl Rove. Uh, there's a quote from him where he said uh, during the Bush administration, my job is to ensure that we have a durable Republican majority. And I say to my students, well, if we take the set, let's say he succeeds, and we bring a Martian to the, the world, and we say, apply the Huntington to Huntingtonian two turnover test to this world in which Karl Rove has succeeded, you would say, this is now not a democracy. So everybody obviously wants to stay in power. Um, However, it's just reading Daniel's book where, you know, for me, the Oscar, the story of people like Schlesemann, like uh, Gustav Schlesemann, like Oscar Hercht, who, you know, they could have, you know, gone where it seemed like German public opinion was going and completely given mm -hmm. themselves over to this kind of Volkish sentiment. And actually, it would have helped them electorally. But for some reason, they don't. And 
I, I guess I thought to myself, well, there was some kind of decency there, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. These guys weren't, these guys were not my, you know. They were, I know, you say, yeah. Herrick, for example, was kind yeah. of an anti-Semite. Yeah, these in, are not guys I want to have lunch with. Right, right but they compared to right. Hitler, right. and if, again, if they were electorally <laughs> minded, <laughs> or even compared to Hugenberg, right? Yeah. If they were, yeah, yeah. and even Hugenberg, weirdly, has second thoughts. Right. So, you know, your story about Hugenberg was also a little bit puzzling because if Hitler is basically what he wants to right. see in Germany, why is he so regretful later yeah. on? Yeah. Is it just because it's not him? Right. But, <laughs> yeah. but the point is, there seemed to be in yeah. this story some sense of, I don't know what you'd call it, but some, some sense of commitment yeah. to the republic that prevented these, uh, some of these leaders from, from uh, giving themselves over to... Right. Um, I guess my view is at that point it was sort of too late. By the time you got to like 1928, I mean, this is maybe getting too much in the weeds, but this was too late that at some point these guys didn't have the organization, didn't matter what they thought. Right. I mean, they just couldn't have won elections in yeah, any sure. case. Yeah. Well, I've been thinking about norms a lot, and it seems to me like there's a middle range of cases where it matters, right? There's cases where the, the basic forces are so aligned against democracy that you can have a political lead that has all the norms they want, they're just gonna get voted out, and uh, if they think that, that, that what the commitment means is that they have to force five elections, then there's just gonna be a violent revolution, right? And then there's cases, which in the United States was for a long time, where the forces are actually so aligned in a positive direction that it doesn't particularly matter whether or not the norms are deep, because there's a good constitutional system, the economy is going great, it's always been a democracy, so why worry? Hmm. And I think what with starting to determine now, and what your book helped me to think through, is the role that norms have in situations where it could go one way or the other. And to me, the book makes a very good case for the fact both that the norms matter at that point, and to go to another even larger debate in the social sciences, that agency matters in those moments. Um, and that, to, to me, the book, both to some degree, I mean, it's always chicken and egg, obviously, like, has that methodological assumption, but I think also in how many insights we're able to get from that methodological approach makes a very convincing case for, for the fact that we should have that methodological assumption. Mm -hmm. So we've got a little under 10 minutes and three more people who want to ask questions. So my suggestion would be I take all the questions and we'll let Dan and the panel have one more go at it. So that would be Art and Mary. And this gentleman, please identify yourself. Uh, Art Goldham. My question uh, follows on uh, Moshe's question about where is the left and picks up on this yeah. uh, uh, issue of norms. So the point was made that uh, counter-revolution plays an important role in stabilizing democracy. And presumably what that means is that it suppresses extremes. You have some uh, pressing for a broadening of inclusiveness and representation. Uh, that is achieved, uh, but it uh, spawns uh, more extremist uh, demand and uh, to suppress those demands, you need a counter-revolution. Uh, in order to remain a democracy, however, the counter-revolution, counter-revolutionary party needs some uh, party with which to alternate uh, an establishment left party, let's say. Mm -hmm. But a pattern that we've seen recently is the argument that the establishment parties tend to converge uh, and exclude uh, uh, a large uh, segment of the population which uh, regenerates the uh, extremist forces that the counter-revolution was supposed to uh, suppress. So at that point, what happens? So what uh, defines democracy? Uh, and uh, to me, this uh, uh, is characteristic of the moment that we're in now, particularly in Europe, where uh, uh, the uh, establishment uh, uh, feels itself constrained by external forces, by membership. Hi, I'm Mary Lewis from the History Department. Um, my question, I had a two-part question, part of which was already addressed by Daniel Smith's question. I wanted to ask about what constitutes a strong party, and if you think about the extent to which the Republican Party today controls uh, governorships, uh, legislatures in state, in many states, um, you know, gerrymandered the House so that it's virtually impossible. <laughs> for the opposition party to win. Um, so I was gonna ask what a strong party is if that's not a strong party. Um, and that raises the second 
question, which I think Eric kind of just alluded to a little bit, is what is democratic about what that strong party is doing these days? Um, and a bigger question, which I think perhaps intersects with some of what Yasha and Amal were saying, um, at what point does the firewall become a form of enabling for the far right? Um, what I mean by that is if we look at Europe, for instance, um, the National Front's been around in France since the 80s, since the 70s really, but really taken off in the early 80s. Um, and the right, the center right, has in various ways, and even I would say the center left, in its sort of obsession with republicanism, have in a way enabled um, that development by sort of not being able to change the discourse from the focus that the National Front has had. So the National Front's worried about security and about identity, well, so are these other parties, right? And they're trying to out National Front the National Front, and they're terrible at it. So I guess I'm just wondering what the firewall is. And I get what it is for Tories, but I don't see on the continent the same kind of firewall. I mean, what, what constitutes a firewall, I guess? And uh, the final question goes to uh, this gentleman here, and then we'll let the panel address whatever parts of it they like, and we'll give Dan the final word. Thank you. That was like a Kennedy school. I wondered if you could say more about compromise, which you mentioned a few times, even though I'm British. And I think the story you tell is the story the British establishment tells itself in the word recuperation, is what I'm sure you've come across. Get your compromise in first. But we also tell ourselves another story about the roots of that compromise. So if we're asked the question, are you Catholic or Protestant, the Anglican establishment, the answer is yes, <laughs> including embedded in our creed, so I'm sure you, you know. Whereas in Germany, it's, no, you can be a, um, a Catholic or a Protestant and under different princes and, and rulers. And this seems to have echoes right down to the current day. So, so my country looks at the Grand Coalition two in a row in Germany and thinks, my God, we only have to have a grand coalition in times of national disaster and, and war. And outside of that, um, the opposition is necessarily will vote with uh, the government. What I'm inviting you to do is to say, are there kind of historical roots to different dispositions towards political compromise, compromise in high politics? So considering we only have about four minutes, shall I see if any of the panelists want to jump in and then you can wrap up? Panelists, panelists? Panelists? Sure, just on the firewall in Europe, because I think it's an important question. I mean, I guess to me the firewall looks like the CDU, CSU never going into any sort of discussion with a party like the IFD. It looks like in Sweden holding the Sweden Democrats and, and enforcing that court all sanitary. So you do see big cases, big important countries in Europe in which that still persists. And we can't forget that. That's been going on for 20 or 30 years with serious political costs to all these parties. It's in part why they've lost votes. But even in France, I would argue there has been a containment of the Front National. 30 years, millions of votes. What is it delivered on policy? Almost nothing, right? Yes, it conditions the, uh, the entire political spectrum, but there's a reason Le Pen says, you know, they, they're, they're copying me, what, I'm the original, these are the copy. It's a non-falsifiable way of saying you have influence on politics at the end of the day, even when you don't control a single seat. So, I mean, I think that that's mattered, and that's been a big part of the story. And yes, France is unstable, you have all these millions of votes floating around going to the full national, at the same time, credibly shut out of power. Uh, I'll just say very quickly, uh, and I'm going to ramble through this quickly because it isn't fully uh, formulated, but it occurs to me that in your understanding of strong party, uh, it's a party that understands that within a democratic system it needs to appeal to the median voter. That's kind of part of the, the rationale, and, and a weak party is one that dis, uh, you know, just disregards this and goes to whatever ideological leanings its, its base emphasizes. And I guess I would uh, just say that or, or, or question uh, what that means under the current conditions and, and how, how far this, this can be stretched given that 
the, me the, the middle has bottomed out. You know, the middle is really, so appealing to the median voter is no longer a viable strategy of coalition building um, across the advanced industrialized world. And what does a strong party, can you have a strong far right party? Mm. Can I? Yeah. Please. So I want to make very, two very quick points. The first is that, so in response to Dan's question, Daniel had a, does have a really strong argument about what are the structural conditions that lead to strong or weak conservative parties. But then the question really is, then what's the, who's this prescription in the end for? When you say you need a strong conservative party, that's the price that you Democrats need to pay in order to get democracy. Well, if the determinants of that all exist uh, in the distant past, then what actually, who is this prescription for? The second point I will just say in defense of Oscar Hurt, who I didn't even know existed before I read this book, you know, compare Hurt to Paul Ryan, right? So Paul Ryan completely conceding, whereas Hurt had the decency to withdraw from politics. Okay. <laughs> and Dan, you get the last word. Um, yeah, so... In terms of, I th so uh, Mary, I think David's answer about what a firewall is is, is is exactly is exactly the idea. And I guess one one interesting thing is to think you know people often say actually when I was in Moscow in December and these and I was kind of saying well, you know how to deal with populists they need to kind of build a firewall to keep these keep the populists out. And this and this Russian political scientist was kind of almost gleefully saying that's such a short term solution. I mean you, you know the Western civilizational project is collapsing and that's the best we can come up with. And I guess I reject, so, so I think Amal's point that, you know, they can no longer, the middle is no longer there. I, I guess I view history as kind of going through cycles, and there's moments through time where there's popul populist uprisings, and the best we can do is keep these guys far from power in the short run. You may say, well, this is, we have to come up with a better solution, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure. I mean, my, my hope, I guess, and my expectation is that, you know, if there'll be a renewed period of economic growth, there, there will be, a, you know, the, the refugee crisis will pass and we'll get through the next crisis and there'll be parties there to kind of, to keep these guys out. So I think, you know, with, I, I don't think of history as proceeding along a single path where everything's getting worse or everything's <laughs> getting better. I think we're kind of, go, there's ups and downs and the best we can hope for is a kind of moderate uh, kind of parties to kind of play, play this role. And just, and I mean, as, as I've sort of been hearing it, I mean, I sort of think there's, there's four things that center-right parties can do. They are, you know, what, what to do with facing the populist challenge. One thing is to, you know, we just don't talk to them. The firewall kind of solution, cordon sanitaire. Another is we, you know, go out in the streets and protest against them. Um, another is we, you know, try to steal their message, but we run the risk of becoming like them. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth one, the kind of more, most ill-formed solution, but I, in some ways appealing to me, but I haven't thought about how this happens, is you win the debate. You have, come up with better ideas. And liber this is like liberalism. You come up with a better debate, and you win the argument. And so that's in some ways what needs to happen. I mean, that's sort of the work that I think Yash is involved in and is, is kind of doing exactly this. Just a, a, the final point on compromise. I, I, don't, I feel like I, have, I won't fully appreciate your, your question. I mean, I can't answer the question as I would like. But I, I, at some level, what's interesting is that compromise, I mean, there is this long tradition in Germany. Uh, there's a historian who argues that this tradition of, of grand coalitions goes back to the 19th century at election time of Protestant Protestant conservatives, liberal conser uh, Catholic conservatives forming coalitions against socialists and keeping them out. And he argues this is the basis of the beginning point of corporatism. I mean, in my view, it is much more these were collusive arrangements by economic elites to keep socialists out of power. And I, you know, maybe I'm you know, more of a majoritarian in this sense than a kind of corporatist, but I kind of, you know, I, I, the idea that in the 1920s that the, the conservatives squeezed out the liberals to face a, a labor party and you had two clear choices and labor now could potentially win. This is a much more confrontational style of politics. But at the end of the day, at a, at a kind of constitutional level, they accept the rules of the game. And so in that sense, there's compromise, but there's not kind of compromise before the election has even happened. Excellent. Well, the only thing that remains is to uh, ask you to join me in congratulating Dan. Thank on the you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.